Joining me right now is Florida Senator Marco Rubio. He is the vice chairman of the Intel Committee and a member of the Appropriations and Foreign Relations Committees, and he joins us now in D.C. Senator, it's great to see you. Thanks very much Thank for being you. here this morning. You've done such great work on foreign affairs. Your, your thoughts on that meeting between Putin and Biden? Well, I wasn't at the meeting, so I can't comment. My, my only source of information about it is whatever the White House puts out. But I can tell you that Putin is determined to impose neutrality on Ukraine. In essence, he's not going to accept that Ukraine becomes a member of NATO, and he believes that NATO is eventually going to put troops there and missiles there on his, on his western border and threaten him. And so I think he views this as an opportunity for three reasons. The first is I think he looks at President Biden after Afghanistan, his domestic troubles, everything that's going on, and he figures now is a good time to push. The second is I think he looks at differences of opinion. Different countries in Europe, members of NATO, have give this a different level of priority. Up until a week ago, you had a lot of NATO countries that didn't think this was real, or didn't, weren't too concerned about it, and many that are concerned about it. Some want to do a lot about it, and some really think it's a manageable problem. And third, because I think in his view, this is, this is, uh, this is just uh, something that uh, I think the term they, they like to use is this cup of patience. Uh, it's a Russian terminology. I don't fully understand it, but it basically equates to our red line, which is the language he's now using uh, increasingly. And, uh, and I, I, I believe yeah. that what it is for him. So I think it's a very delicate and serious situation. And I think it's important for the president to explain to the American people why what happens to Ukraine is in the national interest of the United States. What is our national interest? Because based on that is, is how you determine how involved you get and what options you, you would even consider. Well, that. That's obviously, yes, the, the number one question. Thank you for that. But I've got to I've got to wonder why President Biden is so concerned about the border of Ukraine. And yet our border is wide open uh, to Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we are, you know, we are arresting two million people this year for breaching the border and 600,000 others got away. I mean, is, is there no acknowledgement of that while he focuses yeah. on the Ukraine border? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ironies out there, right? I mean, you know, we have, the, the, we, we have people entering the United States illegally who get released into the population after processing, uh, even if they're not vaccinated. And the people who arrested them and processed them were going to get fired if they're not vaccinated. That, that, there's a lot of crazy stuff like that happening. And, and I think that's what happens when, when your policy agenda is driven by lunacy and driven by radical left-wing Marxist ideology that becomes the base of your party and not by you know, common sense wisdom and not by things we know that work. Yeah, I, and so you, you have this world right now where Joe Biden is now in charge of implementing this, the remain in Mexico policies that he ran against, not just because a court told him to, but because frankly, if he doesn't, uh, the border situation is going to continue to unravel. That's right. And, and, and then there's China. When are we actually going to see some teeth uh, in this policy, uh, pushing back against the Communist Party of China. I mean, you've been working on legislation for a long time in terms of uh, putting guardrails in place so that Americans do not fund the expansion of the Chinese Communist Party by investing in Chinese stocks. Where are we on that? I know that the NDAA uh, passed the House, but I want to get your thoughts on when, if ever, we're going to see any real policy against China's bad behavior. Well, it's going to be hard under this administration because this is an administration that's heavily populated by people that are deeply invested in a 20 years, uh, you know, conventional uh, ideology and belief or orthodoxy that don't, you know, China is a country we need to work with. And as the more we work with them, the more they're going to become like us. And, and they believe this stuff and, and they're still wedded to it. And then, of course, you got John Kerry running around uh, trying to do a climate deal with China as like a, the crowning achievement of his, his long career in politics. And he doesn't want to do anything that it upsets China. So you, you do have some people in the administration that probably want to be more aggressive about China, but you have a lot of others who are sort of want to balance this thing out and not go too hard and still think there's hope for China because they've spent 20 years invested in that and they don't want to walk away from it. And so, and, and they want to, you know, you know, they want to be popular in the interna international community. So, you know, it, it's, it's yeah. just going to be hard to have real policy that takes this on as long as people like that are making decisions.
And, and in the meantime, China is rising. The Communist Party making no secret of the fact that it wants to overtake the United States as the number right. one superpower. And all of these companies have their interest in selling their widgets to 1.4 billion people. Look at this deal Apple just did. Apple CEO Tim Cook reportedly signing a $275 billion agreement with China back in 2016, where Apple got, uh, you know, got, got all of this easier regulatory treatment because it promised that it would uh, train the CCP on, on the iPhone development and on pretty much getting them to a place which is a better competitive place than the U.S. is. How is that yeah, possible that there's, well, this is allowed to happen? Because what's happened here over the last 20 years uh, since China was admitted to the World Trade Organization is our economy and many of our most important companies have become heavily dependent on China. There, that this dependence leads to the fact that on a daily basis now, we have not just government leaders, but major and important American corporations and leaders of industry advocating for policies and taking actions that are bad for America and are good for China. We have American investors and we have people in this country who invest in companies that are building weapons designed to kill American soldiers. Soldiers in the future, and they do not care because when, when forced to choose between a billions more dollars in profits from China or the well being of the country they live in and supposedly call home, you know, they, they choose the profits. And, and, and that's incredibly damaging. Yeah. And I think the Chinese played it that way. They understood that as a vulnerability and they continue to exploit it. Even, even the company that is the parent of the recent weapons launch uh, out of China, which surprised apparently our, our defense uh, mechanism, uh, and that is a company that investors can buy and invest in on some of the indexes out there. I mean, it's just extraordinary, and I had to call it out. But I want to get your take on Biden hosting this virtual summit for democracy starting today, inviting over 100 governments meant to showcase the benefits of democracy, including Taiwan. Taiwan. Some of the countries on the list are raising questions. The Philippines, Pakistan getting invited, even though they both have been cited by the State Department for having significant human rights issues. Russia and China have slammed the summit. Senator, what's this summit all about? And it's funny to see, you know, the president talking about freedom and liberty and democracy when uh, he's still pushing forth his unconstitutional vaccine mandate. Yeah, so a couple things on that. The first is, that in and of itself, the idea of holding a summit of democracies and bringing them together is not negative. I think any time you can use the convening power of the United States to create alliances to push back against totalitarian regimes, you should. I think the bigger and fundamental question is, what credibility do we have after these? Because it's great to bring people together, but if it doesn't lead to some actionable items that emerge from it, then it really was uh, just symbolic. And, and I think for the United States, we have some fundamental challenges under Joe Biden, whether it's Colombia asking, you know, why are you doing something we asked you not to do when last week they said the FARC, this Marxist rebel group, is a terrorist group, really, is no longer a terrorist group. Whether you're that or whether you're our allies who basically were left stranded and scrambling after he decided to, to withdraw from Afghanistan on an arbitrary timeline without even consulting with them ahead of time and working it out with them. You've got a lot of alliances around the world that are wondering, yeah, I mean, it's, democracy is great and we'll go to your Zoom meeting, but ultimately, you know, what does this lead to and can we really count on you when the, when the rubber meets the road? And, you know, I think it's a credibility problem this administration has. It has it here, but I think it increasingly has it internationally. Well, I mean, the credibility is just you know, plummeting. Uh, Senator, you're talking about this idea to push through his Build Back Better plan and the Bernie Sanders budget at a time that Americans are hurting. Inflation yeah. is getting stoked by all of these dollars face, uh, chasing too few goods. What are the chances that his spending and tax plan gets a vote by year end? Well, I mean, Chuck, Chuck Schumer can set it up any time he wants. And, um, and he continues to say he wants to do it before Christmas. So we'll see if that's true. Um, I don't know if he has the votes. That's a question for Joe Manchin and, and, and Kristen Sinema. He doesn't have any Republican votes for it. And it's nothing less than the uh, codification of socialism. I don't think we should be under any illusion that this bill is nothing more than codifying socialism. And they're bragging about it now. They're putting out videos and promotional material about how all these government programs are basically going to be involved in your life from cradle to grave. And if you want to understand why it's a bad idea, it's not just about the debt and the money. That's important. It's about the fact that when the federal government is the sponsor or the primary payer of a program, 
then they can use that program as leverage to get you to do other things. The reason why these mandates are out there, for example, on nursing homes and other places, is because the hospitals, it's because their biggest payer is Medicare. And if the federal government says you can't get Medicare dollars if you don't follow our mandate, you're going to have to follow your mandate. They want to have the same amount of leverage over early childhood education, pre-K, child care, uh, health care, increasingly, everything. And, and they want to put the federal government in charge of that because ultimately Marxism and socialism isn't about economics. It's about power. It's about control. It's about shaping a country the way you want it to be and using the power of government to get people to do what you want them to do. That's a lesson we should have learned over the last couple of years and, and, and that I hope uh, we, we, we don't forget. Where is this Marxist thread coming from, Senator? I mean, it is extraordinary what you say and what we're all watching. And by the way, uh, your colleague in the House, Ro Khanna, was with me uh, about an hour ago, an hour and a half ago, and he said that this spending plan is all paid for. I said, no, it's not. He said, oh, yes, it is. It's paid for. It's a, that's a gimmick, gimmicky language. For example, it's not all paid for. That's number one. It's interesting. The CBO says it's not all paid for, but they, they, they say, well, right. the CBO is, is just one opinion, right? There are a lot of other opinions out there about it. But, but here's the truth is, if you create a program and you say, okay, over the, it, the program is authorized for three years, and so over the next 10 years, you only have three years' worth of, of, of um of costs, that's one thing. But these programs are, are, yeah, they may be authorized for three years, but they intend for them to be permanent. And that's what they're hoping for, right. that once these things get into the ground and once they get running, they're never going to go away. And if you calculate it that way, then it not only is it not paid for, but it's a massive expansion of government that's going to lead to tax increases way beyond anything they're publicly acknowledging and, um, and, and will fundamentally redefine. I mean, listen, if this bill passes, it will fundamentally redefine America's economy in a very negative way and will strip us of our dynamism. As simple as that. Yeah. Senator, it's great to have you this morning. Always a pleasure Thank to talk you. with you. Thanks so much. Thanks for Senator having me. Senator Marco Rubio joining us this morning in Washington. Quick break.